Do you want to learn the tricks that top leaders use to get the most out of themselves and their teams? Well, Naftali Hoff is here to help. Lead to succeed. Picks the brains of top leaders to learn about their challenges, insights, and best practices. Here's Naftali. Hello, Lead to Succeed Nation. It's Naftali Hoff, and welcome to Lead to Succeed, Episode 51. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Hunter Thompson. Hunter is a full-time real estate investor and founder of ASIM Capital, a private equity firm based out of Los Angeles, California. Since starting ASIM, Hunter has helped more than 250 investors allocate capital to over 100 properties. He has personally raised more than $30 million in private capital and controls more than $75 million in commercial real estate. Hunter has been featured in Forbes, Globe Street, Inside Self Storage, as well as a variety of other media news outlets, podcasts, and radio shows. Hunter is also the host of the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast, which helps investors learn the intricacies of commercial real estate from the comfort of their home, car, or office. Hunter, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Hey, thanks again. Appreciate it. No, Happy really a pleasure. And it's always one thing when you bring a great guest on, which I know I did today, but on top of it, as a fellow podcaster, um, I love that because I know that you just understand the platform and I'm, gonna, I'm literally looking forward to a great conversation um, in a very impressive bio, but you know, there's always a backstory to it. So tell me, how did you get started in all this? Yeah, so I mean, my entrance into the financial markets really happened at the time that most people were devastated. You know, in 2008, I was still a college student. And so when 2008 happened, I was insulated from the trauma that really took place in the financial markets. And from what I knew also from kind of a personality standpoint, I knew that there would likely be an opportunity in the financial markets when 2008 happened. And so I kind of went all in on just financial assets in general. I tried to learn as much as possible obviously because the stock market is the most common investment vehicle. That was my first step in that direction and had success investing in stocks as most people would in 2008. If you yeah. started at that time, just using typical Warren Buff types of strategy, Warren Buffett types of strategies focused on value-based investing about two years later, as I was kind of contemplating what financial freedom meant and what I was trying to accomplish in terms of the world of finance, something happened that pretty much no one talks about that is a major defining moment in my career, which was the European debt crisis. And this is basically very similar to what happened in the United States, but it was in Europe where a lot of central banks froze up. It caused unbelievable volatility in the US markets. And after all this research I had done, everything that I had read and everything that I had thought about and all the time I had spent reading these books and doing this research and watching CNBC, something happened that was completely out of my control, that was completely unmitigatable, that all of a sudden, all the CNBC anchors started talking about the grease bond yields. And they're saying, if the grease bond yields remained below 7%, the S&P 500 was going to be fine. But if they went above 7%, the S&P 500 was going to collapse. And this was happening on a daily basis. We would see 600 point intraday swings in the Dow Jones, by the way, for those of you that weren't paying attention at the time, the grease bond yield certainly went above 7% and they yes. had massive bailouts and it caused unbelievable uncertainty. And I was just thinking, how is it the case that after all this that I had done, that something like this, something as obscure as the grease bond yields is playing a pivotal role in my financial well-being. And so I started to identify investment vehicles which were simple enough so you could actually mitigate the risks associated with the investment. And that quickly led me to real estate. Interesting. You know, there's a lot that you said that I love. Um, one of them, it's actually interesting because I recently signed up for a program with Dean Grazioni, um, who's one of the leading you know, coaches out there and somebody who certainly is very big on, you know, imagining your, your future self and kind of like identifying where you are. He's got a whole loop that I'm starting to learn about now. And the idea that, Oftentimes, we can get, um, what's the word I'm looking for, trapped by or really hurt by some kind of trauma, you know, whether it's being let go in a job or, you know, a downward trend in the marketplace or something. We say for, to ourselves at that point, I'm never going to do that again. You know, I'm never going to pursue a job in that space because it just was such an unkind experience. I'm never going to invest there again because my, my you know, my, my portfolio just tanked or whatever it is. And so you had the benefit in a way, at least initially, of being insulated from the trauma. 
Yet at the same time, you had a later trauma, just a couple of years later, something completely out of your control, which kind of reminds me, as I just did a training yesterday on SWAT, you know, you've got the two components that are within your locus of control, strengths and weaknesses, the components that are beyond your control, opportunities and threats. And so it's all kind of like coming together, and yet you had the foresight to think about how can you leverage what you've accomplished? And at the same time, I'm understanding, I don't know if you said this explicitly, and you can certainly correct me if I'm wrong here, not be necessarily as exposed as you were to something like the Greece, you know, the Greek bond debt or, or any other external issue, but they have more control. And you did, I know I'm throwing a lot here, but I'm sort of like, you know, distilling everything you said. You also talked about how you wanted to get on the pathway to, you know, um, uh, what's a quote? What's a, what I'm looking for 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 independence ultimately, right? To financial freedom. So, you know, you you kind of rode a curve there, and at the same time, you were very strategic about it. And so, here's a question I wasn't planning to ask you, but since we are in that space, how, what what are some methods that you use to help people, or help yourself, frankly, be really strategic about? Number one, how to protect yourself against things like this. And number two, how to really stay focused on not just living in the moment, because too often that's what we do. You know, we deal with our tasks and our job and all this, but how do we go beyond that to say, I want to be, in your case, financially free. And I want to achieve that goal maybe even by date X. So how do I now reverse engineer my process to get there? So any tips there would be fantastic. Oh, yeah. I mean, listen, you're asking the most important question. And I think what the answer is is simple. It's, I don't want to come up with this stuff on my own. If I do, I will almost certainly fail. So what my answer was coming out of that situation was identify people that had accomplished what I was trying to accomplish and network with them and learn from them and use their success as a playbook so that I could replicate what they had done. And it will really, really help in those efforts if you can inspire them to help you for free. Hmm. And so that's really what I wanted in to do. In a mentorship type role, is that what you're describing? Yes, absolutely. I mean, you basically want to get that snowball started as quickly as possible. But the way the snowball grows quickly is if you have people behind you that are more successful than you, that are yeah. high performers in whatever sector you're trying to be a part of, pushing you along. Sure. And then it doesn't rely only on your own intuition, your own book smarts and your own IQ, but also the momentum that you created for yourself um, through those mentors. Yeah. So I feel that I was very fortunate, especially since, like I mentioned, I entered the real estate sector at an incredibly favorable time from historical standards in terms of valuations. But even more favorable was the fact that I moved to California, a market that had been completely devastated. And so not only were the valuations low, but when I began to build that network of mentors, it was based on people who were able to weather that economic storm. Mm. And so that's something that I have to be they very- They were still hopeful. in the game. They were still in the game. Certainly. Certainly. Because yeah. many people in California lost their shirt. I can imagine. So I try to be humble about that because of the fact that I know that if I had moved to California in 2005, it'd be very challenging for me to identify the people who had systems and processes in place that were going to be able to get through a storm like that because everyone was making money. So, I mean, just to touch on this really quickly, because you asked, I think I'm, I'm writing a book about this right now, or it's related to this topic and something that I have found that has been so helpful for me and also inspired me to help others is a combination of two things, an undying sense of urgency and a clear outline of goals that people are trying to accomplish. If someone that's young contacts me and they have a very clear understanding of the direction that they're heading and they have an urgency at which they want to accomplish that goal, it creates a sense of momentum. And the question internally for me is, do I want to help them? And do I want to have them, do I want to make a mark on their lives positively? Or do I want this person to be a competitor of mine in five years? Because they're going to be. And so you, you're kind of, as an entrepreneur, you have that sense of competition. And you say, you know what, I would love for this person to be aligned with my worldview and then could maybe help my own business and I could help theirs as well. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, you know, we could do a whole podcast on that particular topic, but yeah, I think sure. for, especially for young entrepreneurs or people that are new getting into a particular sector, that's the best way to do it. Okay. So now, now we really got to unpack some things here before I go any further on some of my other questions. Um, I'm a very big fan of mentors. I'm also a big fan of, 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 you know, learning from people's experiences. And so that's why I'm part of 
actually now two mastermind groups and really try to, you know, to take from the collective wisdom, understand, and of course, to contribute significantly as well. So let's stay with mentors for a moment, uh, Hunter. And I have two questions for you on that. Number one, because I think a lot of people probably are asking this in their own mind as they're listening to you. Number one, how do you identify what tools, uh, what attributes do you look for to identify the right kind of mentor? That's question one. Obviously, you mentioned in your case, you were looking for people who were still in the game in California who didn't lose their shirts. That might be a criteria for you in that case, but that's not necessarily a universal application that we could all take from. And question number two is, if you're some young guy coming right out of college, let's just say, or frankly, anybody, but not necessarily somebody who the mentor knows, recognizes, appreciates, and certainly wants to build a relationship with, how do you get access? So it's, again, yeah. identify the right mentor, and then how do you actually get in the door with them? Yeah. So I would say that identifying the right mentor can be challenging right now with the amount of educational content that there is available online. There is so the podcast community, as you know, has become incredibly saturated. There's a lot of shows out there that are explicitly just for marketing purposes and don't really add a lot of value to the listener base. And so as a listener, it's hard to distill who is actually focused on educating their base as opposed to just propagandizing their base, right? And both are reasonable in terms of the cost benefit. But I have found like our podcast, the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast, it's probably the most dense real estate investing podcast on the internet. I mean, we have the most dry guests that can possibly be available, securities attorneys, but we've also had things like Grant Cardone and stuff. Okay. So what, what I'm really getting at is it's a very challenging time to identify who's actually succeeding in the business. And, and so you have to be able to distill that. So one of the ways that I have done this is as an investor, it really is all about gut feel as well as credentials, trust, but verify, right? So it's a combination of all those things. When it comes to a mentor, this is a, a person that you will very likely mold your worldview around. And you can tell very quickly if from a gut feel perspective, they're in line with your worldview. And now they may have a more clear outline of that world, more, more detailed version of that worldview, but it's all about is this, person, is this person the kind of person that I want to implement? Is this the lifestyle that I want to have? Do they have that lifestyle that I'm looking for? Have they achieved the things that I'm looking for? Can they bring the things that I need to the table? Especially if you're considering paying for a mentor, they need to be bringing a lot to the table in terms of deal flow, in my business at least, deal flow, infrastructure, potential other investors. All of those boxes need to be met. And so you can apply the same kind of rules to whatever sector that you're in, but there needs to be a lot that's going on there that's being brought to the table, but it all goes back to that, uh, that gut feel perspective. Okay. And let's go, let's talk about access now. So, you know, somebody doesn't know you, but you feel that they could really help you. What are yeah. some tricks you could use to, to help? I mean, in my case, for example, I'm very open about it on my podcast. You know, I use this podcast for a variety of reasons. Number one, I want to bring great people on and share awesome exactly. content. On the other hand, I also want to develop relationships in many cases with my guests, because yeah. to me, the people who come on the show are the people I can be learning from and people who I could be, um, whether it's deal flow or just having relationships with that have um, positive implications in my life in other ways as well. And so it could be that you have a podcast and I find that that's, by the way, a great way, like you and I don't know each other at all. I hope that that's going to change over time. But yeah, right we were now. introduced from a common friend who's also a podcaster. And, you know, it was the podcast. Otherwise, I doubt we'd ever have a conversation, certainly not at this particular time. Um, but the platform creates the framework or the opportunity around which the conversation can occur. So if you've got a podcast, you already have, a, you know, you already have an in, potentially. But at the same time, you know, how does an average person who doesn't necessarily have an existing platform, reach somebody who's one, two, 10 levels above them and say, I want to connect with you. And eventually, potentially, I want you to be my mentor. Yeah. So first of all, there's a million ways to do this, but there's not, a, there's many ways to do this incorrectly. Okay. I would say that the, the way that it's worked for people that have reached out to me is a great way example is if someone sends me an email that says, hey, here's a screenshot of a review I just left on your podcast. I love the show. I've been listening to the episodes for a long time. I'd love to get 
15 minutes of your time to tell you what I'm currently doing in the real estate sector and what I want to be doing. Get your thoughts. I will take that call. I will take that call because they're reaching out to me and they're, they're saying, look, I've already added value to something and I love the things that you're doing. I've listened to many of your episodes and that inspires me. And the reason that inspires me is because again, it's creating that sense of momentum. Now, I also get messages from people on LinkedIn all the time that are void of that give and take. It's just a matter of, hey, here's my product. It's $1,600 a month. Please click here to subscribe. It's like, we're never going to have that conversation. Never. So it's really a matter of understanding that if you're in a position where let's say you, what do you have to bring to the table? You may not have money, but you may have a lot of time. How can I leverage that time to add value to your business so that we can create some reciprocity there? And I think that that's a really good starting point for anyone that's getting started in the business. Yeah, that's fantastic because they add real quick. Yeah, sure. Regarding the topic of mentors, I have noticed in we, we have a mentorship program and the people that come through, I have noticed that there is an incredible correlation between the speed of execution and their overall success. So the delta, the difference between the time at which they come to a realization that an idea needs to be turned into practice, I need to take action, and the time at which that action is actually completed, the shorter the distance, the overwhelmingly shorter it will take for them to accomplish their overall goals. And it's something as simple as, let's say that they come to the realization that they need to open an LLC. If 24 hours later, I get an email from them saying that they opened the LLC, that person's career generally skyrockets from there because that speed of execution. And as someone that's a high performer in the real estate sector, if you are a high performer in whatever sector you're in, when you see that movement, that's a clear sign that that person is going to do well. And again, it motivates you to help them. So we're talking about kind of the both ends of spectrum. But if you can show that sense of urgency and then that speed of execution, you start to feel the snowball move very quickly. Yeah. So let's stay there, Hunter, because this is now actually the second time, at least that I heard, you talk about urgency. And urgency yes. is really important because we all have dreams, we all have aspirations, we all have things we want to do. But what separates the high performers and the high achievers from everybody else in most cases is that they get things done. They don't just have a vision, even if they have it clearly defined, which is a problem in and of itself. They, they take real action around it as opposed to everybody else. And part of taking action, like you said, is feeling this sense of urgency. But for many people, that's a difficult thing because they've gotten used to their current reality. So maybe they don't like the level of income that they're generating, but it's kind of what I've been at for a while. So I'd love to see a change, but I don't necessarily have something really driving me to move to that next level. So if you've got a coach or a mentor or somebody's kind of pushing you, that's one conversation. But let's say somebody just comes to you, you're listening on your end as the potential mentor I'm hearing for, does this person have it? But my question to you is, how do you advise somebody or how would you suggest that somebody who's looking to, I know it's, it's nice to say, I want to become more urgent in my work. I want to sort of like raise to the next level, but, but there's real work involved. There's got to be an internal shift and there's real action behind it. So talk us through that process a little bit, please. Yeah. So, I mean, just the question regarding like how to actually get the work done to really not only just but say also it. the mindset, the mindset yeah. of really sort of owning this. Now I want to, I want to be different. I want to make a meaningful change in my life. Yeah, I mean, so two things. The first thing is that people that struggle to make progress are typically focused on the past. People that uh, have it seems like it comes very natural to them are very much focused on the future. So number one, stop letting those thoughts about previous challenges play such a role in your motivating factors for the future. So if you have any kind of problem that continues to come up as reasons why you can't succeed, just stop saying it out loud. That'll probably help you significantly. If it doesn't help you internally, which it will, it will certainly help you externally in the sense that less people will be thinking of you as the kind of person that's constantly focused on the past, which can really challenge and inhibit your ability to acquire these types of networks that we're talking about on the show. And the other thing is something that I felt really powerful is clearly identifying just, okay, first of all, significant time blocks are the only way that I've ever been able to get anything done. Okay. So these are time blocks of, let's say 90 to 180 minutes. Uh, these time blocks are the way that you actually can 
allow your brain to get to the point of coming up with interesting ideas that will help you actually take your business to the next level. So what I would suggest you do if you're in this position right now is immediately block out three 90 to 180 minutes to just focus on where you want to be later down the road. Okay. And this is a five year, a 10 year and a 25 year type of goal. And then reverse engineer those goals on a monthly, quarterly, or annual basis. Now, the interesting thing about this is that if you have a huge, big, hairy, audacious goal, and it seems like something that's way out of your reach, whatever industry you're in, if you start to reverse engineer it in terms of monthly, quarterly, annually, you start to really familiarize yourself with that and then also becomes a blueprint for the next 5, 10, 25 years. And so if you always are checking in on yourself, you got that transparency, you have that extra level of checks and balances, this is really how large companies have the success that they do. So if you start implementing that for your own uh, personal business, it's a great way to do that. Another way, like a simpler way of saying that is if you can identify three things that you can do every single day to take your business to the next level and actually work on those three things every single day, you'll start to see your business scale very, very quickly. The challenge is most people do not know what those three things are and do not spend the time actively pursuing those three things. They spend their time doing things like constantly answering emails, answering text messages, checking social media. I have interviewed hundreds of people on this topic. Never has anyone said, I answered enough emails to now I have $100 million. That's just never the case. Never the path. What really happens is they come up with interesting ideas during the time where they aren't answering emails, and that's what helps them get to the next level. You know, it's so interesting you say that because I find myself at this particular time when we're having the conversation in what I call kind of like a social media lull. You know, I, I built up a brand on different platforms, primarily LinkedIn, but certainly not exclusively. And I've spent a lot of time, you know, sharing content, engaging, things like that. But, and, and this is not to say that the platforms aren't valuable. They very, very much are. But for some of the things I really want to be doing, I've decided I needed to scale back there so that I could really dive more deeply on a variety of different tasks and projects that I have as priority for me right now. And I think sometimes we get sucked into whether it's email or social media or other distractors. And oftentimes I tell my clients, turn off your phones. You know, I have somebody right now studying for a big exam. It's going to move him to the next level of his career. I said, we got to power down. Let anyone who you really need to be hearing from, let them know how else they could reach you and allow you to just get the studying and get the work done. So whatever it is in terms of your specific industry, I think the point is really well taken. Block out the time much better than a to-do list identify the key actions that are necessary that are going to take you to the next level, and then make sure that you are disciplined enough to consistently follow through on those. And if you have a mentor, great. If you have a coach, also great. Maybe just an accountability partner. Ideally, somebody that you have to report to and say, I got it done, that is going to ask you about it. Because I find that when you rely on yourself, if you're super motivated, you have a chance. But for most people, and I'm including myself in the process, if I don't have some other way to, to demonstrate accountability, something is going to fall. And that's just been my process. And I think all of us have to figure out what works for us. Yeah, completely agree. You don't want to rely on your free will, right? Because free will is, is finite and it, it eventually will run out. So you need those external factors to continue to motivate you. Yeah. So you talked about before your podcast and how it's, very industry specific and perhaps even on the borderline of dense in terms of the content. Um, but what I'm interested in hearing is that, you know, ultimately, as Dan Pink says, you know, to sell is human. All of us, no matter what we do, whether we're in sales officially, uh, whether we're in you know, service providers, we, 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 we invest, whatever we do, even if we're just in a quote unquote regular job, we need to be able to sell. We need to be able to sell ourselves. We need to be able to sell our identity. You never know when that next pivot will exist or come up in your career, et cetera. And so talk us through some of your sales techniques. Um, you use it obviously to secure investors, but things that may even be not necessarily, let's call it industry specific, but good sales techniques that could help anybody to deepen relationships and hopefully to promote uh, deal flow as well. Yeah, absolutely. So yes, I mean, 
I don't consider myself, quote, in sales, but you mentioned earlier, you know, I've raised $30 million from investors, right? So that means $30 million has gotten across the finish line. Yeah. And the reason that's really happened is because I've spent a lot of time building up an infrastructure to attract the right types of clients. So, you know, before getting into the $30 million, let's talk about the first time I tried to do this, which is I tried to have an investor luncheon where I had friends and family come and I did a 30 minute presentation on the mobile home park business, which is a fascinating investment vehicle. I did a, I knew intimate details about the business. I had had success investing previously. I presented to people that cumulatively probably represented about $30 million, 30 people, each of them had to have at least a million dollars to be there. So that's really who I talked to. And um, it resulted in zero dollars being invested. Zero. Okay. So this was a massive, first of all, terrifying moment for me and sure. also a wake up call that I needed to create an infrastructure to attract and educate and nurture the right type of people that were already interested in the product of real estate investing. And then I spent significant amount of time, effort and resources towards creating that infrastructure. And so, so what something does that, that I, look like? What does that look how, yeah. how does one, without going too deep in the, in, the, in the conversation, how do you, first of all, how do you identify the right kind of customer or the right yes. kind of audience? And number two, what is the infrastructure that you're using to draw them in? Right, so first of all, each business will have its ideal client, mm -hmm. but it's important that you know who that ideal client is. And then cater your business, cater your marketing, marketing efforts towards those ideal clients. So again, taking those 90 minute blocks to really fantasize about if you could have a thousand clients, what would be the profile of those clients? How old the avatar? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And so I did that. And for me, it became clear that I was going to be able to facilitate this infrastructure by creating educational content. And so writing a lot of articles, writing email blasts, conducting podcasts, being a guest on other podcasts, it's a very scalable way to educate a client base because it doesn't mean I have to have each of these conversations over and over again. When a potential lead comes to our website, they are overwhelmed with the amount of content that is available to them. Meaning that by the time we actually get on the phone, they're extremely sophisticated in terms of the, con the conversation. And so it's just a matter of explaining a few little details. And, you know, and this is not to brag, but just to put it in perspective, it's such a great way to spend your time. Number one, even if all you do is go through the process of creating that educational content, that alone will help your sales ratio because you're clearly identifying, clearly codifying what's compelling about your product. But that's to say that no one even ever read it. You're still going to be ahead of it, even at that point. Yeah. Um, now, of course, once it is available on the website, you can have people move through the sales process much more quickly. In fact, you know, being in the business that I'm in, it's, it's, we're playing for a lot of marbles here. So we have had people come to the website, read articles, sign legal documents, and wire quarter million dollars all within 48 hours without ever talking to me. But they know me intimately because of the amount of content that we put out. Sure. So, and, and what is the driver that brings them to your website to begin with? Like, how are they getting there? You know, if you're Googling around, if you're searching for the types of things that we offer investments, you know, re recession resistant real estate, mobile home parks, cell storage, apartments, if you Google around enough, you will eventually be led to our site. And by the way, the fact that the content is somewhat dense, it lends itself to less beginners and more intermediate investors. And that's, again, that's just my personality. I like to have those more dense conversations. And so I'm being myself and it's attracting the right people. Yeah, well, that's the key thing, right? You're number one, being yourself, which is great. But number two, the fact that it's drawing the right person into your conversation. I think that's Correct. critical. You know, so you could be, you could be, I'm, I'm not going to use the term dense as a pejorative term. I'm saying sure. you could be dense if dense is what you like. You know what I mean? Exactly. If your business demands density then be dense exactly. <laughs> exactly you know but at the same time if people like you know more storytelling of this and that then maybe they look for a different platform everybody has to resonate in some level with the right crowd whether how they however they find you um so i'm just curious on this point before we pivot um is there a way to know and if so what is your sense 
of how much people are doing business with you, not because you've got great copy on your website and great tools and things like this, but just because they've connected with you either through writing that you might have done, certainly your podcast, engagements with you, maybe you've done some talks. How much of it is Hunter the person and how much of it is Hunter's platform and great content that you've created that's almost in many ways faceless in nature? Yeah, man, that's a great question. And I don't, I don't know that I'll answer it in the way that you're looking for, but I will give you the honest answer. I like honesty. Especially the podcast medium. Uh-huh. There is no difference between who I am and the platform. You can have a very clear understanding about every component of my life, every thought that I've had through that podcast. And that's the reason it's been so beneficial. So, you know, the listeners of the show know the fact that I just got married, the fact that where I went on my honeymoon. Congratulations. Oh yeah, thanks. (laughs) So things like that, I mean, it really is no different. That the the podcast medium is such an intimate connection because you're literally in someone's ears as opposed to even if you're watching a a movie or a documentary on someone, you're usually doing something like texting, for example, the same amount of information isn't quite getting to you the way it is in a podcast when you're doing something like driving and listening. I feel like driving in particular is a great way to inspire the ideas that actually stick with people because driving is the kind of thing that keeps you intellectually engaged enough so you have to not go off the road, Mm -hmm. but you're still able to process that information. So yeah, to answer your question directly, there is no difference. And that's why it's been successful. Interesting. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to go off the rails here on a sidebar, but it's interesting. You mentioned driving Um, not only because I love to listen to content in the car, though I must profess as much as I love podcasts. I also listen to a lot of audio books in the car, but in addition, what I find is that driving is an experience even if it's an experience we do every single day and so i'm a former educator so i often think about how do we get content to stick how do we get learning to occur and to be processed and to really be internalized and one of the things we need to be thinking about is creating experiences mm-hmm. around the content so it's not just i'm at my at my i'm at my desk you talk about fidgeting with your phone but being at your desk is not a it's not a distinguished type of experience. It's like every day, same thing, but driving already, just because of the scenery around you, the cars you're interacting with and all of that, it creates a level of experience that if there's now content kind of piping in around that experience, your brain takes it in in a different kind of way. And to your point, if you are giving a podcast, you are sharing content. So there's the nonverbals, there's the verbals, there's the tone of voice, there's the inflection. And all and the storytelling, which I'm sure you you weave in despite the density sometimes of the conversation, but you're still a human being with your own personal story. And so that ulti- automatically helps people identify, is this a guy? I'm speaking about you, but it's really about me and anybody. Is this somebody I can connect with? Is this somebody right. whose whose message resonates with me? Does his wisdom or her wisdom does it does is it something I feel I I get added value from? And therefore, as a result of all of that. Do I reach out in some kind of way? Do I want to deepen the connection? Do I want to do business with them? All of that emerges from going beyond the intellectual content of a, of a blog post, perhaps even, or just a website to a real interaction with a real person who's just killing it in a space that really matters to me. Yeah, completely agree. I mean, I opened up the show with the conversation about how I got into the space regarding the European debt bonds. And so people may remember me as the guy that was obsessed with the European debt bonds, but we've also dropped a lot of informational content during the conversation as well. So I think this is a fair you know, assumption of, of the density. Oh, I'm sure, yeah, no, that's great, that's awesome. Okay, so now we're gonna pivot and we have what I call rapid fire. So these are really short and succinct. I'm sure you could unpack either, all of these in great detail, but I'm gonna ask okay, you to quick. keep it nice and tight. The best investment you ever made that's not a stock or real estate. Uh, easily rich dad, poor dad. You've probably heard it a lot. So I'll, I'll, I'll segue to four hour work week and also double, double by Cameron Harold. That's as Got fast it. as I can go. Oh, that was great. If you could plaster a message on a massive billboard along any of the glorious expressways in your community or elsewhere, what would it say? Move with a sense of urgency. Nice. Okay. Something neat about living in LA that few people know. <laughs> You know, the people are actually not what they people thought they were 10 years ago. The, the fact that the entertainment business is here is one thing, but the economy has been 
really created massive robust opportunities and now the the social dynamic of LA has changed drastically so i really like it here nice and finally your favorite method of content consumption it's got to be podcasts cool okay so before we get before we wrap up um two other things number one let everybody know where they can reach you where they can connect with you where they could find you and the awesome work that you're doing yeah. So name is Hunter Thompson, uh, the founder of ASYM Capital. That's A-S-Y-M capital.com. You can find all of our educational content at cashflowconnections.com. And the iTunes podcast is the Cashflow Connections Real Estate Podcast. That's cashflow, two words. Definitely check them out. You can, uh, you can just hear the wisdom that Hunter brings to the table. And I'm sure that their podcast, I'm not in real estate. So, uh, you know, I, I'm not familiar with it from before, but I definitely want to check it out because I can already see that whether you're in the industry or not, there's a lot of wisdom to be gleaned. And finally, leave us please Hunter with one final life lesson before we wrap up. It's all about who, not how, right? So if you're struggling to do something, it's about people, you know, it's about who's your best friend. It's about who can solve that problem for you, not how to do it. Focus on the things that you love doing and find someone else to do everything else. And that's so powerful, if I may just add, because often we think we just have to know all the answers and we have to just go through the work and what's it like to have success without it. But you've made very clear, my experiences, I think, are the same, masterminds, all these ideas are leverage the wisdom, the talent, the experience around you so you could be on the fast track to whatever success you want to achieve. Hunter, it's been such a pleasure to talk with you. I feel like I've known you for much longer now at this <laughs> point. And I'm really glad that uh, our friend Adam made the connection and look forward to sharing this far and wide because I know that Lead to Succeed Nation is going to gain a ton from the wisdom you shared today. Thanks again. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to this episode and for investing in yourself so that you can lead to succeed. Before you go, don't forget, social media junkies, please share this recording with your networks and tag me as well. I'm on Facebook and Instagram at Naftali Hoff and on Twitter at Impactful Coach. 